Welcome to the Knife Junkie Podcast, your weekly dose of knife news and information about knives and knife collecting. Here's your host, Bob the Knife Junkie DeMarco. Welcome to the Knife Junkie Podcast. I'm your host, Bob DeMarco. And on this edition of the podcast, I'm speaking with Richard Rogers. Richard's highly sought after knives are refined and sleek and built to be carried unnoticed, but used with abandon. Some of his recent blockbuster designs include the Slim Utility under Rogers Design and the CRKT collaborations, the CEO and the Montosa. But Rogers has been making knives and winning awards since 1996. So these are just recent drops in the bucket, big drops, but just recent drops in the bucket. And I'm so honored to have him on the show. But first, are you irrationally fond of knives? Do you like this show? Well, check us out on Patreon. There are three levels of support. You get Knife Junkie stickers, a mention on the podcast, exclusive content, early access to the podcast with no ads during the show, and more. Your support helps fund the infrastructure needs of the show. That's hosting, servers, apps, and equipment, as well as knives for review and giveaway. So just check us out on Patreon and see what helping us can get you. And the quickest way to get there is by going to thenifejunkie.com slash Patreon. That's thenifejunkie.com slash Patreon. The Get Upside app is your way to get cash back on your gas purchases. Get Upside is an app you put on your smartphone, and whenever you need to get gas, search your area for savings, claim your discount, fill up your tank, and then take a picture of the receipt with your phone. And that's it. You've just got cash back. Visit thenifejunkie.com forward slash save on gas to get the app and start saving. Again, that's thenifejunkie.com slash save on gas. Richard, welcome to the Knife Junkie podcast, sir. Hi, thanks for having me. Uh, it's it's great to have you. Uh, so you're you're joining us from New Mexico. You live and work on a cattle ranch, and uh, well, I you know it's very different from the life I lead out here uh, on the East Coast. And um, I don't know when I think of your knives, I think of refined and sleek, like I mentioned, um, you know, in in that intro. Uh, it's interesting to me that that these knives have come out of a ranch life. What, what is that like? Uh, ranching is, it's different. I mean, we live way out in the boondocks. You can see I'm right now in the local library because our internet connection is nowhere near good enough to come on this thing. Um, but it's different. It's got a lot of elbow room, no neighbors. Uh, closest neighbors are two miles away. Um, but it's, I don't know, it's different. It seems like it's a, 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 a life filled with hard physical work day in, day out. Yeah, some of it. I don't do as much as I used to. I've got a son who um, it takes care of most of that. I put most of the work off on him, at least any that I can. But, um, yeah, I mean, it's right now we're cabin out heifers, so. You check them in the morning and a couple of times a day. Then you get up at like 2.30 in the morning to check on them, make sure they don't need any help or calving. And then you start it all over again. Um, the way ranches work, it's, um, it's not a lot of riding and roping and stuff. It's more maintenance, keeping waters going, windmills going, um, fences up. A lot of times a ranch can rock along for uh, a couple of weeks with just barely some regular just checking in a couple of times a day. And then everything will fall to pieces. <laughs> You'll be working yeah. for a week straight trying to fix it. How did this uh, evolve into um, a life of making knives? I said since 1996, this has been uh, your career. How how did that evolve? Uh I always liked knives. I used to, I went to college and worked for 10 years as a CPA, but I, it was spent all my time dealing with the government and people's problems. And that wasn't fun at all. So I um, uh, quit that after 10 years and just was working on the ranch. Uh, and I was doing some gunsmithing at the time, but um it wasn't a gunsmithing was more of a local thing back then. 
Uh, there was no internet. There was mm. no uh, the only way you could advertise is in the back of a uh, gun magazine. So most of the gunsmithing was local, and there were liability issues. I knew a guy who got sued for something that wasn't his fault at all. So I was looking around. I was always making things. So I figured, well, I'll, I'll try making knives. I actually had a factory knife that was um, horrible. It, the edge would uh, dull just looking at it. <laughs> I mean, you trim one little thing, the edge would be gone. And it was supposed to be one of the better brands. So I went, well, I can make better than that. So I just started. You just started, did you? <laughs> and you became Richard Rogers, <laughs> the acclaimed well, knife maker. Did you have Did you have anyone um, to help you uh, with the ropes or anything like that? Or was it um, truly a slow, steady? It, well, I got the Loveless book and started working with that and um, just trying it and doing it. And I didn't even know there were custom knives. That, you know, mm-hmm. there was an industry for it. And then finally, I got some knife magazines and found out they were having them. And went to a show in Arizona. You know, I'd been making for like a year and a half. And that was the first um, knife show I'd ever been to. First time I'd ever seen a custom knife. So when you first started making knives, uh, I, I'm assuming, like most people, you started with fixed blades, hunting knives. That Yeah. That kind of thing. So were th- were those uh, knives that you were using um, in in your other life, in your life as a rancher? Oh, and, yeah. And so what, what knife do you, all the time. So what kind of – you're just doing – you're using that knife for everything. Yeah, hay bales or feed sacks or whatever. So you, time. so you had some national brand knife, and uh, it, it kept dulling on you. Yeah, um, it was horrible. So what did you do when you started making knives to make sure that, that uh, did, so how did you learn about the heat treating? and uh, Just by reading. I, okay. I'm not a people person, so pretty much I learned stuff by either reading or banging my head against a wall to like figure it out. <laughs> like I said, it's, it's so much different now because you can go on and see YouTube videos on how to do everything or yeah. um, and for wireless forums or make contacts and back then there was none of that it was either met a knife maker that was um that could help you out or um, just learn reading books that's all i had yeah sometimes just uh you know in 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 my current profession i learned the skill that i've been using for 20 years that i use every day i i had to learn it just by uh hacking away as a matter of fact um, when I started learning that, there was really very, very scant internet. You couldn't just look up the manual. Uh, so I, I kind of had to figure it out uh, as I went. But in a way, learning it that way got it really uh, in my blood or in my in my core. Yeah, yeah. You, I mean, it's it takes longer, but you can learn to do things that, that work for you or, or, or come up with your own methods. So um, let's... But after after I went to that show, I saw some of the knives there, and I'm like, holy moly, I'm just, I have no idea what I'm doing. Mm-hmm. So I went home and worked real hard. It was, um, went back, because they were having a special spring show, and it, this were in um, Mesa, Arizona. Uh, so I went to the special spring show, and um, there were like 110 tables, and that weekend, there were like 25 people who attended. Oh. Nobody came. So after about the first hour, everybody was just like, well, this show's done. So I walked around and talked and talked to some people and showed my knives. I, Look, I'm, I need help. How do you get better? Oh, just keep working at it. You're going to get better. Like, no, I'm not. I, I need some feedback on it. Finally, um, Tim Hancock from D Holder. Um, we're walking around talking, and they looked at him and picked him up. And I'm like, you know, ask them, you know, what can I do better? How how can I fix these things? What's wrong with them? And Hancock looked up from the knife and looked at me like this. 
do you really want to know? <laughs> <laughs> yes, I really, really want to know. You're not going to hurt my feelings. So he gave me some pointers. And then I drove home and um, just six hours and um, worked on him. And then like three weeks later, I called him and he said, yeah, come on down. And so I went to his um, shop. So he could look at them and give me more feedback, which is six hours. Um, and um, so we went there and I spent like from 930 in the morning till 430 or about 330 in the afternoon just watching what he was doing. And he was kind of explaining a few things. And really, that's all I needed. Just some guidance about what to look for and kind of how to do a few things, how we ground the blades stuff like that then it was just go home just keep working on it until it got better so how did you make that jump from uh fixed blade knives to slip joints i've seen some of the incredibly um well beautiful slip joints i love slip joints some some of the traditional patterns uh, but also these crazy looking ornate multi-tool kind of uh you know, the king's Swiss army knife, if you will, uh, some of those those kind of things. H how did you go from hunting knives to those? Those seem like such like the opposite end, such refined little mechanisms yeah. and everything. Um, well, you know, everybody at the time, everybody made of like a four inch hunter and do this. It was hard to really distinguish yourself unless you're doing just really wild stuff. Remember, because if you either got a photograph in a magazine or you'd see people at two or three shows a year, I mean, that's the only time you'd see them. Hmm. You, um, there was no internet. There was no place to uh, show pictures. Um, none of that. You just, so you'd go to shows and hope they sold. Um, unless people stumbled over you, there was no way to really build your business um so i was looking for other things to do and uh, uh gene shadley and terry davis came out with how to make multi-blade folding knives and so they did that and i bought a copy and looked at it wow okay and um i thought well everybody's going to be doing it because the, the book came out and then um uh, after like six months, nobody was making them. Well, I'll try. And I made a few and they were really rough. But then I kept working at it. Pretty soon I was able to make them fairly well, you know, and just build from that. It seems like a particularly uh, steep learning curve, uh, multi-bladed slip joint knives yes. because of because of how everything has to fit together how all the blades have to nestle in with one another and um yeah slip joints are easy to make work but they're hard to make work right mm. um if the like you want the spring flush in the open half stop and closed positions i mean you want it flush and it's just three on a single blade it's three pieces of steel the liners in the spring mm. and if it's off by half a thousandths you can tell easily and half a thousandths isn't much so it's a lot of tedious grind a little grind a little grind a little until it's all flush in the same in all three positions uh, and then after that well if you can make a single blade then you can make a trapper because you just super glue the blades and springs together and then just work them all at the same time so that's no trick and then once you get into the multi-blades with blades on the other end, that gets difficult because you, you can't run. You spend all your time learning how to grind blades straight. And those blades aren't straight and they're not a uniform taper. Uh, they have to taper from the back to the front and the top to the bottom. It's kind of complicated. And that's to accommodate the other blades that you're putting in there so that they don't rub, but so right. that they fit like a hair's width uh, away from the other one. 
uh, yeah, you should be able to put like a, uh, the old test was just to be able to put a business card or a thicker piece of paper in between. You should not be able to. No, you should be able to put a oh, business you should be card. Able. There should be oh, enough right, space right. there. Because if otherwise, they're, they're, right. if they're too close, then then people push in from the side to get them open. Right. Uh, most people don't know how to really open a slip joint. They, they always shove hard from the side, but you, you really are pushing up, not in. You push up on the blades. Okay, so one thing in your – oh, I'm sorry. You were about to say? Oh, well, and then after – you know, after you make one with the blades that pass, then okay, you got three blades, so you put two other blades that pass, and you've got a five blade. The only trick with five blades is where do you put all the nail nicks so you can get to all of them? Mm. That starts to be a real problem. Those knives, uh, in in looking at your your website and uh, in your gallery, you have one. It's uh, I said the King's Swiss Army knife because it's so ornately engraved by obviously someone incredibly talented um, uh, oh my god i mean just He's my beautiful. favorite that big scroll he does it just i just love it it is in uh, look at that look at that um and and you've got all these really great looking tools you've got that incredible recurve blade that little one you've got the scissors which to me is you know and then here's this Bow trap or sow belly, whatever. But it's a but sow, uh, belly. It's a sow belly, sow belly stockman, but a five blade. Right. And then uh, up top, though, you have is it this one? Maybe it's not this one. You made another one with the tweezers, with yeah, the that, tweezers, just like a Swiss one, Army. The one on top should have tweezers. On. Oh, I love that. I love yeah. that. And, and see, I made. I started on these after the Sheffield exhibition knives came out. Um, and they had all these beautiful uh, old Sheffield folders mm. that were just magnificent. They were just, that was their, you know, the best they could do. And so I'm like, well, let me try to make a few of those. So I found an old horseman's pattern in a show and I made that, which the, a lot of the problem with mm. these kind of knives is there's nobody you can ask how you make a corkscrew, how do you make a right. ball or, a, um, or any of those plates. It, it's just, you just have to figure all of it out on, on your own. Do you mean because they're all made uh, by machines in factories now? Or No, but nobody makes them. I, I, who would you call? Right. I mean, I mean you, now there's a few people making corkscrews, but this was years ago. Okay. I see what you say. I see what you're saying. What 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 private person like the only people I can think of are Victorinox and the giant companies that have machines doing yeah. it. Oh yeah, they're just but uh, two seconds to make a corkscrew. Um, I can only think of one. Uh, uh, Sinkovich has a cool corkscrew ca um, uh, that he that he has, or wine key. You know, one of those yeah. things. That's that's a beaut. But he's uh, doing it on a fourth axis on a CNC. Oh, oh, so, yeah. so all of these, so, okay, so this all, knife. All of the, the tools on that are made by hand. And, and the, and the entire thing is made by this horseman's knife. Now, yeah. something like that seems like it would take an incredible amount of work in terms of hours, not to mention the fact that, uh, that, that, uh, a world-class engraver also did plenty of work on it. Um, without, without sounding too gauche, what does that cost? What would you charge? Uh, and I never asked this question, but I'm just curious. It looks like such an intense labor to create. Oh, it took me forever. It took me, you know, over a month to make all those parts and the cost of getting engraved. And then I took it to shows for a year and a half and nobody would buy it. Uh, I'm like, you couldn't sell it, which is why I no longer make knives like that. Uh. And then I took it and I finally sold it to a guy and he looked, can you knock these sides off it, knock the frames off it and put a stag on it? It'd look better than that one. I have an idea. Why don't you go get a knife with <laughs> stag handles and I'll sell this to someone? Well, hey, you know what? Uh, but but man, what a what a what a beautiful knife! I mean, it really it looks like something you would see in a museum uh, coming from a different era. It's it's. Uh, so uh, 
those, um, that sort of incredible, uh, incredibly refined build then evolves into liner locks and double detent folders and frame locks. How did you make that move from, from slip joints? Well, I had been making just regular slip joints and stuff, and I tried some uh, of these more ornate ones um, and tried to get in, or I went to some of the art shows, and those were just strange because in the two that I went to, the shows were entirely um, made by one collector with deep pockets. You know, one guy going and dropping. 20,000 bucks on several different knives. And without him, you know, most of the people wouldn't have sold stuff. Because mm -hmm. um, the, the art market goes up and down. And I decided, you know, that's not really a good way to make a living at this. At the time when I was looking around for something to do, um, that was kind of when they opened the border with Mexico with NAFTA. Oh. And uh, the price of cattle, they just brought millions of cattle over from Mexico. And the price of cattle here went to, um, it just knocked it down to nothing. They were selling for the same price as they did in the 1950s, mm. you know, 40 years before yeah. or so. And I'm like, well, I've got to actually make money at this. So I started looking around for different things to do. And I did the art stuff and, you know, I was, I was capable of doing it, but um, it's one of those things where you have to build it, do it for years before people start really uh, buying your stuff, I guess. Um, and then uh, I was talking to Luke and I thought, well, maybe I'll try CNC eventually. And so I got a CAD program, hmm. uh, Luke Burnley recommended Rhino. Um, so I'm like, yeah, and sat down at that for three days and got where I could kind of manipulate stuff with it. And he said, hey, we're doing a, a special course here in Albuquerque. Come do it. Okay, great. So I go there and I'm like, whoa, I am so far behind. I'm barely understanding what the instructor's saying. But I was picking up some things. And a uh, friend of Luke's, Pat Pruitt, was taking the course. I don't think I'd met him before, maybe met him one time. But he is a nice guy, and he is really talented. He's been using Rhino for years, and he's a really good machinist. So I got to talking with him, and he really didn't like me at first. He's like, whatever. He didn't get me. I've got a strange sense of humor. But um, eventually I was talking to him and said, you know, I'll I'll help you out. I'll work with you on helping on Rhino and maybe I'll cut you some parts. So we went back and forth. It was like, God, I still owe him huge because it, it had to be brutal for him to lead me through it baby steps, you know. <laughs> I'd work, work, work and send it up there. And he'd send it back and change it or change it and send it back. But it, it still blows my mind that two people that are three and a half hours apart to work on a project and just email files back and forth. Yeah. I was just going to ask you, you were, you were talking specifically about the CAD files that you were sending back and forth yeah. and he was giving you advice and you were tweaking and going back. Yeah. 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 It is amazing. Uh, um, yeah. I mean, I still get blown away by FaceTime and the fact that we are video chatting to me still is amazing, but yeah. that's, but it's like, um, that, and, um, just, I had no background with design or CAD or anything like that. So it was just banging my head against a wall, just trying to figure this out. And finally, we got some uh, drawing good enough that um, he was going to cut me some parts. So he cut me like five sets of parts and sent them down. And I'm like, because he, he cut the, like the blades and the, some liners and a couple of scales um and i'm like you know he treated the blades and put them together whoa this is the way to go it takes a lot of the drudgery out of mm. making the knives the standing there in front of a bandsaw 
getting hit in the face by all the debris. Yeah. So I'm like, this is great. When can I get more parts? And it's, it was, this was like in September, October. It says, ah, I'm kind of busy. Uh, I should be able to get you some more in May. <laughs> and I'm like, well, that's not going to work for me. Yeah. So I looked around and bought a UC and C mainly because I didn't want to crash into it. So I figured, I'm on my own. I have no idea. I've never even seen a CNC. But but you knew how to speak the language now, and that's the important part. Well, um, I could do the CAD enough. I'm still learning tricks and stuff on that. But then I got the CNC, and Pat says, oh, I can help you set it up. Well, so... Right. Let me ask you this. Uh, how did that change your design process uh, when you went from pre-CNC to CNC or pre-CAD to CAD? Did you go from pencil and paper to um, to CAD exclusively? Uh, I'm, I'm presuming that you use pencil and paper at all. I mean, how did, how did your design process work? And then how did it change once you went, uh, you know, electronic, if you will? Well, with like the slip joints, uh, a lot of times you would find uh, a picture of one you liked in an old, um, an old uh, Sheffield catalog, or if it was a more contemporary design, you could just order one and take it apart and use it as a pattern. Mm. That's why a lot of see it, the slip joint guys just do the same kind of traditional patterns. Um, but I had never really, I had I'd drawn some slip joints, but they were like existing ones, nothing brand new. So with this, I was like designing all on my own, and I'm not artistic. I cannot, I can't draw at all. I, I can't. I have my hands don't work like that. I mean, I like flunk kindergarten, can't even do stick figures. <laughs> you it's seem you, you seem to draw well in steel and titanium and other materials. Yeah, making knives, I could take a bar of steel and just keep grinding on it until um, it looked like a knife. That was easy. Um, but then I started learning to draw in CAD, which is great for me because then I could get uh, lines on the monitor and then uh, modify, them, you know, mm -hmm. tweak them until they till they looked like what I wanted to. Look like. So, which was your first knife uh, designed and and built uh, using CAD and CNC? That was, that was the Arc. The Arc. Do you do CAD you have do you have one of those in front of you? I do. So, no, I don't. But, okay. Uh, CRKT makes it. Um, oh, uh, they call it the um, the Inara. I think so. It it looks like an arc. <laughs> yeah, that's yeah. Real original. It's like flat on the bottom and a big arc. On the top. So that is a cool design. Well, you know what we we've we've, uh, we've spoken a while. Let's hold up a couple of your knives. Let people know who might be unfamiliar. Um, uh, like with your work you know like that oh, slim God. utility which is such a cool knife and then you know is your your crkt um uh collaborations really speak the same language like the montosa to me is man yeah. that's a great that's a great one and i bought uh, the producer of this show jim i got him uh the ceo for i don't know christmas or his birthday he loves that knife okay yeah, i don't I, i've got a Montosa that I carry in my pocket. <laughs> okay, hold, right hold, hold it up higher and open it up. Let the people see. Yeah, up a little bit. Higher. Yeah, there we go. Man, that is... Okay, so in looking at this knife, this is a liner lock. This has modern materials. You know, you've uh, you designed this. You've well, uh, you know, uh, gone... I don't want to say gone beyond slip joints, but uh, you have incorporated so many more things. You've explored so many more eras, uh, areas than slip joints at this point. Tell me, um, you know, using that knife or or another one as an example, tell me what you're really looking for when you're designing uh, the knives you're working on right now. Like, what what are the goals? What do you? What is a great knife? What is a great knife composed of? Overcoming some technical difficulties, we are back with Richard Rogers. And I was asking you, Richard, what, in your opinion, makes a great knife? Uh, what I look for in a knife, 
first of all, it has to be functional. I like uh, um, just something, what I, what I like in a knife, I like it to be nice and slim and thin and uh, something you can carry, lightweight, that you don't even know you're carrying it until you need it. Um, functional, I, I like a, you know, a point on a blade and a little curve in the edge. I don't always design that way, but different knives have different use. Well, um, I think of, well, you know, you, you, you talk about how you want it slim, you want it easily carried and then, uh, you know, kind of brought out for use, but not really considered much. So coming from a ranch environment, but also looking at these knives, which seem like gentleman knives, they seem so refined. Would you call your knives hard use knives or are they, um, are they things you would carry around the ranch? Yeah, I carry them all the time. Uh, hard use. Yeah. I mean, everything should work. Uh, some of the knives are thinner and lighter than others, but, uh, you know, as long as you don't abuse knives, you can use them for anything. Heck, I took apart an elk with a three blade stockman once. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, you know that that term hard use almost, uh, 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 you know, it, it, it doesn't exactly roll off the tongue because what the heck is that really supposed to mean? And isn't pretty much any knife unless it's junk. Um, but yeah, I you know, it's just an interesting to me um, contrast of what I think of um, your environment being. And then when I look at the knives that you make, they they just I don't know. It, it's an interesting contrast. One seems like my imagination tells me that the ranch is, is uh, you know, salt of the earth, rough. You know, you're out there with the elements, but the knives, you know, you want to put on a tuxedo to carry that <laughs> slim utility. It's so classy. Yeah, that's more of a personal aesthetic kind of thing. I just like, in design, I like clean lines. I don't like a lot of curves and and real swoopy stuff. I don't make a lot of, in fact, I just made my first or designed my first uh, Persian type knife with a trailing tip because mm -hmm. I, I've never really had a lot of success with actually using knives with the big trailing tip. They don't work as well for my ordinary use. Uh, a blade shape that uh, is on the Slim Utility and the Montosa. I mean, they, they're similar anyway. Uh, they have that sort of abrupt clip at the front. Um, I, it seems like a really great utility shape and uh, seems like you could do a lot uh, with... I, I have not uh, had either one of those knives, but it seems that shape is kind of universal. Um, but it also really has a signature of your design style. How, you know, how, how do you, what influences your style besides, you know, clean lines and such? I mean, there's, there's gotta be, you know, the clean lines are clean lines, but there's something that makes your knives a Richard Rogers knife. I don't know. The, the mainly form follows function. I, I like the, that little clip tip because it, it leaves a, a nice, real strong point. It's not the best thing in the world for stabbing things, but there's enough, you know, there's a sharp point so you can do detail work, but it's really strong. It's not a real thin, unsupported part of the knife. That is a big uh, problem I have. Uh, I love, I love, uh, well, I love all kinds of knives, but, uh, you know, I, if I have something with a real delicate tip, I will most assuredly uh, drop it on a tile floor or something like that. And, um, you know, make an accidental Richard Rogers clip <laughs> front. Yeah. Um, so you, what is this relationship? Describe a little bit your relationship with uh, CRKT, um, how that works. Um, do, do they find designs of yours that they like and, and ask to license them? Or do you, like, how does that relationship work? Well, I was interested in trying to develop a um, relationship with a company um, a few years ago, and um, I emailed and talked to people at like uh, Kershaw and Zero Tolerance and Boker and CRKT Luke 
uh, Burnley had had a deal with um, CRKT and and he really thought they were great people to deal with. So he set up an appointment so I could have a meeting with them. Uh, nobody else would return my calls or <laughs> or couldn't get a foot in the door. So um, I went and had a meeting with you know Doug and at CRKT and showed them some designs and they looked through all the stuff I brought and uh, picked up a couple. They thought, well, we'll we'll try a couple of these. Or we'll take them to back for review at the company, um, but you know we'll let you know in a few months whether we're interested in producing some of these. So I counted eight, uh, and you, you said you weren't sure, but I counted eight models: the CEO, the Cinco, the Quattro, the Duali, the Inara. Mm -hmm. That's a dually? I'm sorry. Yeah. Du oh, it's a duali. Like, uh, yeah. I don't know. It, it, people say that. It's just like my, um, you, you've seen a dually pickup truck, right? The uh, Out here, a big pickup truck with the Ford tires in the rear. You know, oh, the, yes. Yeah. Uh -huh. It's called a dually. Okay. And my son, my son had a, had just bought a horse with a big wide rear end that he named dually. Oh, <laughs> so Sally said you should call this new one the Dually too because it has a blade and an opener on. It. Oh yeah, yes, yes, and and a cool shaped blade it is. It's kind of almost daggery. Um, you have the Inara, the Maven, the Montosa, and the Symmetry. What is the Symmetry? That's a that's a new one, right? Yeah, it was uh, introduced this year. This year and um, yeah, and this year and it's uh, oh, the first double or one of the first double detents, it and the dually have a two detents that hold the blade open and, and closed. Um, and it was just a real slim, elegant knife, uh, you know, real clean lines, top and bottom, open and closed. It, it just seems to work real well. Um, yeah, I developed the double detent system like eight years ago, maybe. <laughs> At least, like I say, I'm kind of off in my own left corner. I um, just work on my own ideas, so I'd never seen it. Uh, Serge Pinchinko was developing something similar right mm -hmm. about the same time. Uh, but, yeah, I developed that, and I showed it to, to CRKT, and they said, well, we can't, we can't sell anything that doesn't flop. Okay. So... Um, uh, I just, I made a few, I didn't do too much because people didn't understand them. Uh, they were mainly designed for places where people couldn't have locking folders. Uh, they function like a slip joint without all the tedious hand fitting of a slip joint. Right. It's like, uh, if, just because you live in a place that's extremely restrictive doesn't mean you can't have fun with your non-locking knife. That's kind of what the double detent is to me. It's, it's, uh, um, you know, it's the ability to, well, like I said, have a non-locking knife, but still, like you said, not be trapped in the tedium or, um, yeah, of opening it two-handed. Yeah, and and yeah, symmetry. Part of it, it's uh, the reason it's named that is it's uh, perfectly ambidextrous. Oh, so nice! You can open it the same with either hand. So is that a uh, is that a front flipper? How, what what's the? Uh... I, I guess you'd call it a top flipper. Top or, flipper. Okay. Uh, front front flipper is probably. It's not traditional. Anyway, hey, let's 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 uh, coin it dorsal <laughs> flipper. <laughs> OK, <laughs> you hear that, people? That's an exclusive. So um, what uh, as you, OK, so you designed or pioneered the double detent um, and you have this uh, s system of of uh, designing and creating knives, both collaboratively and then under your own shingle in your own shop and then also uh in in sort of uh in in oem runs like this latest uh slim utility what design challenges do you have um in your mind as a goal what are things that you think need your attention in the future um uh, to sort of make right in terms of design challenges for folders um 
I don't really try to uh, time the the knife market and try to see what direction it's going or anything like that. I'm like I say, I'm off in my own little world. <clears throat> I don't even really pay that much attention to what's going on, which I probably should. But I just make stuff that I think would be neat. That's actually what I'm getting at. What What do you think is neat? Because uh, every time it's like as a creative person, it's like when you, you finish something, there's always something in the offing that you're like, yeah, I can't wait to get to this project. Can't wait to tackle this challenge. Is there anything like that? Yeah, I try to do it. We're working on a, this is a new design. It's, um, it's very small. It's only three inches long on the frame. And it's a front flipper, um, fairly thin. So I don't know if that's. And that blade is completely, completely hidden in the handle when it's closed. Right. Let's let's see that blade, and then and then that clip. Oh, that's a nice. Yeah, I like the but blade just put. Shape. Put your hand behind the blade, and it will focus on the blade. That's better. That's a little better. Nice. That is gorgeous. So that is a little tuck away, um, loose in the pocket. Um, right. Well, I guess not loose in the pocket because you have – but you could carry that easily loose in the pocket. You've got that beautiful right. clip there. It, it but... was originally intended as a like a watch pocket on jeans or pants mm. so that um, – you could do it. I try to make things flexible. This way, you can remove the clip and replace it with a screw, and um, that way it's clipless but still works. Uh, you can replace the back spacer with one with a, a lanyard hole. Mm -hmm. I, I'm trying. I've been working on trying to make things flexible, um, like this. Um, usually, if in traditional knife making, you um, if you want to change the scales or anything, you have to um, totally refinish the knife because, you know, they're matched up exactly. But with these, with these inlays, um, you can just, um, I can make another set and send them to you and you can swap uh, them out yourself. So it's modular on both the form and the function. Right. That is cool. Yeah, that because, I mean, I've got, had people in Germany, it's like, hey, can you you know, change the scales on this. I'm like, yeah, you can, but they have to ship it all the way back and that type of thing. So it's much easier if I can just ship something to people. That's uh, something that um, TRM uh, has nailed, Three Rivers Manufacturing, with their knives. Uh, most of them, many of them, I'm not sure, I don't think all of them, but most of them uh, have replaceable scales. They have a, a, an abundance of scales that you can replace, but you don't have to take the whole damn thing apart to replace it. You just a couple screws right. here. And, and I love that. And just looking at the, uh, the little watch pocket knife, I'm sorry, what's the, what's the name of this knife? Pop, P-U-P. Looking at the pup here, I'm, I'm, what I'm looking at in that inlay, it looks like uh, checkered ebony wood, or I, I can't tell exactly what the material is. It's, it's beautiful, it's, but I could see you swapping it with something else, too. Yeah, it's G10. Um, G10. There's one. It's actually blue and black G10, so you get a... Mm. Um, here's something similar. It's so hard to see. Um, this is a golf ball texture. Oh, yeah. I like to make things that are feel good, tactical, a, a real good tactile feel, not just looks. Right. Because knives are inherently a, something, you know, you worry with your hands. Yes. Yeah, so, some of us, to the dismay of our wives, who are trying to watch television. Then this is a... Same type of thing. It's got a pattern milled in it. Mm. I like to play with light. This is uh, black Damascus. There, you can kind of see the pattern. I, so it, I, I like to play with patterns to really get some movement in a flat scale. What about the work you do yourself in your shop, um, your custom work? What? 
how how is your day? Do you do you get up and make knives all day, um, barring any catastrophe on the ranch? And uh, and and what's your favorite part of the process? Uh, yeah, pretty much. I work in the shop all day, every day, seven days a week. Um, I uh, favorite part is probably it's either when they're done or when I'm designing them. <laughs> designing because um i want everything perfect and when you're designing them you're just tweaking and tweaking and finally getting it just like you want it but then you know no matter how hard you try nothing's ever perfect yeah it's like um, go ahead oh i was gonna say it's like when you're designing it you're you're living in the virtual world and you can perfect things there and then you have to redo the whole damn thing in the actual real world with with real materials and um i have no you know i have no experience drawing out a knife and then trying to make it i would imagine there can be you know the frustrations are legion you know because uh, because it's easy to make a, a line on a piece of paper and then erase it and make a different line uh right that's different uh, when you're when you're grinding titanium and steel yeah yeah and then like on all my knives i i'm the only one ever that ever touches them basically it's all my own work i don't subcontract anything out and are all when you go to your website and you see the different models are they all active or do you have do you have some that you have discontinued how does your ordering work and how do people acquire your your custom knives mainly i just uh kind of we have a facebook group and that's where mm -hmm. i have most of the contact with collectors and i just kind of as i read it i get a sense of what people want and then i'll make a, a series of knife like five or ten of a particular model i don't take orders because every time i do it feels like there's an, a huge weight over me mm -hmm. and and people are it's like yeah we i wanted that knife but not like that you know, I didn't want what they ordered. You know what I mean? It's yeah. like they have an idea and I have an idea. And sometimes you like, whatever. It's it's more like a weight over me and it's just uncomfortable to owe people stuff. Yeah, yeah. I want your art, but I want you to make it my art. <laughs> Do it exactly uh, like how... Yeah, yeah. I mean, well, that that is that is a big question you have to ask yourself. I would imagine as a knife maker, as someone who's uh, not not only designing and having companies make your work, but as someone who is, uh, you know, a, a highly prized custom knife maker is that you, you have to decide whether you're going to take orders and fulfill orders and make versions of your knife exactly how your customers want them or make exactly what you want and trust that there is a, a group of people out there who love anything you do and love you for your vision and will buy whatever you make. Um, I would imagine that's a delicate balance. And I bet in the beginning you have to go, you have to have books, you have to have orders. Yeah. Oh, definitely. You have to take orders. Like I say, it's not, it's not as bad now with uh, the internet and, and being able to have relationships with people all over the world. Yeah. But uh, in the, olden days when the only time knives were done was at shows then you'd have to take order so how has uh from your perspective how has the lack of shows over the past year affected the the knife world in general and and also your your business um it, it hasn't really affected my business at all at least as far as i've noticed um the knife shows, the lack of knife shows has given me a bit more time to, to develop different models, to work a little more on design because there's no time pressure. You have to have hmm. like 10 knives due at a certain point. So we have to drop everything and start working on show knives. Uh, funny thing. Um, it's been easier for me to schedule interviews like this one without the shows because frequently you know there there uh, over the the two years prior there were little windows of time where there weren't any shows and you were far enough away from the big ones uh that it was easier to to 
grab an hour of time up from a knife maker who needs every moment to make. And then as soon as he got into show season, it was like, I can't talk to you for another three months, man. I got like 50 knives to make. I'm like, okay, I get it. I get it. Yeah. Yeah. Shows, shows are great. Cause you get to see the people that you have, a, you know, shared interest with and who understand what you're doing. Um, but they put a lot of pressure on you to produce things, you know, and you don't want to show up with 10 of one night. Right. So what well, you, um, you and your company, I know annually have a fundraiser. Um, what, what aspect of that is important to, to um, what I'm trying to say is, is, is that uh, is giving back part of what you want Richard Rogers knives and Rogers designs to be about? Yeah, we we really do a lot of um, charity stuff. Not only our fundraiser, but we we donate things to other people's fundraisers throughout the year. We'll be making something for um, Monkey Muster. Mm -hmm. They have a Monkey Muster, and it's in April this year, and they raise funds for Fisher House. So we always donate a knife for them to auction off. And the knife I showed here that's a donation for mm. we're sending that off that'll be uh used to raise funds for leukemia that's a that's a beautiful piece i'm sure it's gonna it's gonna bring in a lot of money for that cause i think it's uh great there are a number of you mentioned lucas burnley before i know he's also uh uh, uh quite a philanthropist and i think it's great when people um you know, recognize their good fortune that you can be doing something that you love, like in your case and in Burnley's case, making knives, and then to turn around and give back. Um, I think it's just another one of those things proving that this is a great community. Yeah, the knife and EDC community is the, they're the most generous people around. I mean, whenever somebody needs help, everybody gets together and, and you know, pitches in. It, it's really amazing. So uh, in, in closing, Richard, what would you say, what advice would you give to a knife maker who's just starting out, just coming up, trying to make a name for him or herself and trying to, you know, brand their work and make a company? I don't know. Um, go to shows, meet people. Um, don't be afraid of criticism. Criticism helps you. Um, uh Always don't take deposits business wise. Don't ever take deposits. You can take orders. Um, because a lot of people have historically gotten in trouble. They take deposits and then use them to fund the knives that they're working on now. And anyway, it all it always turns into a wreck later. Um, as far as building a brand, you, you know, develop your own designs. Try to develop stuff that is unique to you. Great. Well, Richard, thank you so much for coming on the Knife Junkie podcast. It's been a pleasure to get to know you, uh, um, you know, now that I've known your knives for so long and, and didn't really realize some of them were yours. Uh, it's uh, you have an impressive career and you're making some beautiful knives. And I think you have an interesting backstory also being out there on the ranch. <laughs> so thanks a lot thanks. for coming on the show. Thanks for having me on. I really enjoyed it. Great. It's been quite a pleasure. Take care, sir. Have a knife you want featured or reviewed? Call the Knife Junkies 24-7 listener line at 724-466-4487 and let us know. There he goes, Richard Rogers, uh, famed knife maker and designer. And uh, and what I would say is uh, definitely someone who, who marches to his own drum. And, um, you know, that's kind of what you want out of your artists. I know I, I talk about this not being an art form because it's usable stuff that's produced. But, uh, you know, we get pretty close here with knife makers. And, uh, and I think that the way Richard Rogers does it, if I were to be a knife maker, I think I'd probably be a bit like that. I'm going to be over here doing my work, uh, what I think is cool, and putting it out in the world. And hopefully the world loves it. And the world does love Richard Rogers Knives, and it was a pleasure having him on the show. So for Jim working his magic behind the switcher, I'm Bob DeMarco saying have a wonderful week and meet us back here next week for another great interview. Take care.
Thanks for listening to the Knife Junkie Podcast. If you enjoyed the show, please rate and review ReviewThePodcast.com. For show notes for today's episode, additional resources, and to listen to past episodes, visit our website, TheKnifeJunkie.com. You can also watch our latest videos on YouTube at TheKnifeJunkie.com slash YouTube. Check out some great knife photos on TheKnifeJunkie.com slash Instagram, and join our Facebook group at TheKnifeJunkie.com slash Facebook. And if you have a question or comment, email them to Bob at TheKnifeJunkie.com or call our 24-7 listener line at 724-466-4487, and you may hear Hear your comment or question answered on an upcoming episode of the Knife Junkie Podcast.